So yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, just gonna give a little bit more background because I think it's relevant for the rest of the talk. So we're building an AI layer for chat, um, texts, tickets, emails. And so part of that involves deploying language models. It involves deploying these deep encoder decoder models and more recently, uh, more QA style models as well. And so um, James and I who work on this, uh, starting out, we, we encounter lots of issues, uh, just trying to go from you know, what you see described in a research paper towards something that you can deploy and have other people use. Um, so I actually recorded us early on during one of our discussions, uh, just us working on this during a particularly hectic stretch. Um, and so let me play that for you. I should say uh, it, it's a little bit, actually it, it might be a little bit loud, but I may not have shared audio. Which, which is also fine. But if I did share audio, it might be a little bit loud. <laughs> Just fair warning. All right, so, so obviously that wasn't us, but pretty close, pretty close. Um, that's more or less how it feels like sometimes when we're taking these models and putting them out for people to use. Uh, but fortunately, you know, the first time around, it, it was pretty much like this, really hectic. But for the second and third model types that I talked about, each time we were able to deploy things and uh, get things, scale things on our cluster much more quickly, much more smoothly. And so it, it appears at least as though we're learning something in, in this process of deploying the different systems. Um, and so this talk is really describing uh, our learnings. Um, so I wanted to focus actually around three high level themes. Uh, so the themes are cursive dimensionality, iteration time, and opaque models. And I know that many people watching are probably familiar with these. They probably encountered these, you know, these are not specific to NLP, um, although I described this as a talk focusing on NLP. Uh, but al although I think these are themes that are quite familiar, you know, after quite a number of years working on applied AI, applied ML, these are still a few of the themes that I spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, that I learn new things about every month, um, and that I'm still gaining new perspectives on. So, uh, you know, research, new papers are, are going on archive quite frequently, but I don't think these are three issues that are going to go away if you're trying to take NLP models from research to production. All right, so with that, let's talk about cursive dimensionality. Um, so I'm actually using the term in a very loose sense. Uh, actually, here, what, what I'll probably be talking about, what I'll be talking about rather, is probably um, better described by the second term here, combinatorial explosion, and you should probably just group that as sparsity and cursive dimensionality together. Um, so yeah, I'm using this in a loose definition, but this is something that we've all encountered doing machine learning, right? So whether it's be that you don't have enough data, or like we just saw, if a robot has lots of degrees of freedom, or you're training a model and the gradient keeps blowing up, um, or you you know, certain issues pop up that you just never expected uh, because there's a very long tail of possible inputs. Uh, I kind of throw these into the same bucket and, and think of them in a similar way. One quick example, and I guess I'll, I'll just skim over this because it sounds like there's gonna be a talk after this that discusses more, is hyperparameter settings, right? So um, when you're setting hyperparameters, hopefully you have a good starting point to go with where you can change uh, individual settings a bit and see how it does. Otherwise, even with a fairly short YAML file, there's a pretty large space to explore once you start tweaking optimization settings, learning rates, um, number of layers, uh, and so on. Uh, maybe something that is less obvious of uh, this type of combinatorial explosion problem is if we consider a five-step pipeline. 
So the task, uh, I just made up this task, but it's certainly something similar to things we encounter at Sapling. Uh, the task is spotting diagnoses in electronic health records. And uh, let's say the first try that we have is where there's a document, we extract certain sections that might be relevant, that might contain the information that we need. And after that is extracted, we tokenize it. Uh, we apply some simple filtering, maybe just removing stop words. And then finally, we have a classifier at the end that we train to classify uh, the tokens into the correct diagnostics. But the problem at the first pass is that we're seeing lots of high po false positives at the required recall that we need. Um, and so if you think, if you consider this pipeline, one thing that you might consider doing is adding an additional step. So maybe you see that a lot of the tokens that are erroneously classified as a particular disease are actually not even the correct part of speech. So you take your favorite part of speech tagger, you run that, and you add a filter that will remove certain parts of speech before feeding everything into the classifier, right? And Maybe this, maybe this helps, maybe this actually fix the, fixes things for you. Um, but this is the type of thing that I think it's important to be very wary of. Um, why is this? Well, first of all, let's say later on you build a much better classifier, right? This step could bottleneck the performance of your system, um, especially if, say, you know, the part of speech tagger is not really well tuned to the domain. Uh, another thing is, this is not too bad of a pipeline, but if, once you start tossing in additional steps, right, going from five to six to seven to eight steps in the pipeline, then there's just many more points where things can break down. Um, and so just from experiences, and, and of course, there's also the software debt you pay in order to have all the different packages and, and make sure everything's on the right version. Um, and so from our experiences, even though this might be a, a band-aid that fixes things, it's something where you should stop and, and really consider uh, if you need something like this. Um, I purposefully made that example a little bit more, less controversial rather. Um, so the re more reasonable thing to do would probably be to just allow the classifier access to both the original filter tokens as well as part of speech tags, and then it can use the information that it needs. So if part of speech tag turns out to be useful, um, it should learn that. Otherwise, it can ignore it. Uh, but even something like this, uh, and I don't have a good justification for it, even something like this, uh, I feel a little bit queasy about putting that into a system. Uh, one other example, and this is a really old example. Uh, so it, and, and I don't think it, it relates much to some of the tech described in the previous talk, uh, but it's a robot pancake maker. Um, I'm not going to show the video. There is a video on YouTube uh, because, uh, you know, I'm going to mention some things that aren't entirely positive about it. But the idea was in 2011, there was a group that had a robot uh, make a pancake. So it would pour the batter. Um, it would cook the pancake in the pan. It would flip it onto a plate. And then it would take the plate and put it on a table. And... I remember in 2011 when I saw this video, uh, I was doing some robotics and I got super excited, right? Uh, I printed the paper and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna read this and learn so much. Um, and I mentioned this to someone more senior in the lab and I'll never forget, they, they just gave me this look and they said, you do realize everything in that demo was hard coded, right? Um, and at the time, that kind of, you know, took the wind out of my sails. Uh, I still read the paper, but I certainly wasn't as excited about it. Um, but looking back uh, much later on, it's still pretty amazing that they got that demo to work. I mean, you can hard code stuff as much as you want, but there's still so many points at which the process can fail. Um, and, you know, maybe what, what the demo did doesn't, improve generalization uh, or the performance of robots in unstructured environments. Um, but I still think it was a really impressive feat. And, uh, and one other fun thing too, if you see one of those videos, uh, look for someone in the background who looks like they haven't you know, showered or slept in a few days. <laughs> and that's probably the grad student who was hard coding stuff. Um, so, so going beyond pipelines and lots of steps, 
one, one thing you, you might think of doing is just looking at images, speech, and text, and you, you might say, well, a medium-sized 480p image, that's 300,000 pixels, and then if you look at an RGB image, that's three channels, so you end up with almost a million intake values, right? And you can do similar math for audio, so let's say it's 16 kilohertz, which is not very high resolution audio, um, in 30 seconds, and you end up with about half a million in 16 values. And then you look at text, right? So a three sentence paragraph, let's say it's ASCII, so we can represent each character um, as a zero to 255 integer, and maybe 50, 50 characters per sentence, and you end up with 150 intake values. Okay. And I, you might, might look at this and say, hmm, those NLP folks have really been slacking. Um, the image, it, representing images and text just seems a lot more difficult. Um, and I've actually seen people who really should, or actually heard people who really should know better, um, express that sentiment as well. You know, text is just a 1D sequence as opposed to uh, images, which can be 3D speech, which you can transform into these 2D images. And uh, there's also, of course, the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. But with text, uh, one example that I frequently refer to is if you just take this six word sentence here, Alice enjoyed her trip to Wonderland. This seems like a pretty reasonable sentence, right? Uh, outside of Wonderland, all these unigrams or tokens rather are ones that are frequently used. But if you search on the web for that phrase, it never appears. Right? So the data sparsity problem is really extreme for text as well. And I think there's just this notion of brittleness, which isn't well captured by the math that I showed earlier. So there was this tweet from Riza Zadeh where he talked about how there's tons of data augmentation strategies for computer vision, um, but there's not many for NLP and the data can be a lot more brittle. Uh, so, so obviously for images, you know, you can apply affine transforms, you can flip it, you can add Gaussian noise, similar, some similar things for audio as well. Um, there's this notion of manifolds where you can perturb an image off the image manifold and train the system to push it back the entire idea behind noise and autoencoders. And that's something where the model can learn something, a meaningful encoding. Uh, but try doing something similar to text, and I think you'll find that it's very easily mangled. Um, and so this is a case where uh, I think very simple back of the envelopes really, really don't apply. And um, I, I really haven't seen that much research into this notion of brittleness. If anyone's seen any, I'd be very curious. Uh, but this is just something to keep in mind. If you're doing data augmentation for text or, or you think it's a particular task, it uh, might be easy. So lessons from first section on cursive dimensionality. You can try some rough calculations, but keep in mind some complex entanglements. Um, I really do think you try and keep the system simple and try and push you know, different components and software complexity into the data and loss function if you can. Yes, this is me, perhaps just me being biased towards more end-to-end -end systems. Um, and yeah, I think there's actually many more uh, learnings that you can extract from just this notion of combinatorial explosion or cursive dimensionality. Like for example, if anyone's used Zapier, uh, it's this system like if this, then that, where you chain together different integrations. Um, I have some Zaps and they break a surprising amount of time, amount of the time. and that's, that's not even chaining together machine learning systems, right? That's chaining together REST APIs. Um, you know, where, where are things like RPA headed? Um, yeah, lots more you could think about uh, for this topic. But let's move on to the second one, which is iteration time. So I don't think, you know, folks really need convincing that iteration time is really important. I think there was a talk by Jeff Dean a few years back where he described two extremes of the spectrum. One is where you can iterate in a matter of seconds to minutes, and he described this as nirvana, interactive coding. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, maybe training something takes months. And uh, I think he said, don't even try it at, at that extreme. Uh, 
uh, Joshua Bengio, and I'm not 100% sure he said this, but I believe at a deep learning summer school, he some, said something along the lines of, in the 90s, we trained models for weeks. If we had only trained them for months, we may have advanced the field by five to 10 years. So speeding up that flywheel or virtuous cycle or feedback loop is obviously really important. Um, one thing I don't think sees that much discussion though is which feedback loop should you focus on when? Uh, this figure here is one that I made when I was really frustrated. Um, and the, the setting is, it's 2017, um, and we had been working on an NLP system that would correct or denoise text, and we started off with a LSTM model, encoder decoder LSTM, and then, and I'm not sure if people remember this, these convolutional sequence to sequence models came out and got really excited, um, you know, thought, wow, this can really help us perhaps capture longer context, and we end up transferring our, I think it was Theano, LST, encoder decoder LSTM code into the convolutional sequence to sequence code. Um, and then so we completed it, uh, performance, I don't think it improved that much, uh, but was still pretty excited. And then, you know, it turns out attention is all you need. Um, and at that point, I was just like, eh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't think we're going to, you know, switch to this new architecture for a little bit. Um, and to be fair, you know, transformers have been ascendant for, I think, pretty much three years now, almost exactly three years. Um, so it might be the case that uh, the architecture, what, what I'm showing here isn't true anymore. Um, the, the idea is that architectures are changing. And so how much, if you have a fixed budget of time, how much do you want to spend on optimizing architectures versus focusing on other aspects? Um, one thing which I don't think perhaps people spend enough time on in, the, in their, or trying to improve the speed of is decoding, right? Because that's really fast. Um, it's a relatively unchanging procedure. So you might as well just get the most you can out of the decoding process and then switch back once you're sure you have a really good decoding procedure. Uh, what I left out here was, of course, data, uh, you know, as an academic, you assume, most of the time, you assume you just have a data set, but of course, here, we should include data, uh, and that's something where you should really make sure that you're getting the data that you need, because of course, it could be weeks to months before to, that it'll take to collect that data. Um, another thing which I think is also under discussed is model update iteration time. So by this, I mean, you have a model, you deploy it. How frequently do you retrain and bring a new model online for people to use, right? Um, so one example that I saw recently was Instacart. They had a system for predicting the demand for certain products at stores. Um, and of course, with COVID, that model just went way off. And so they had to bring a new model online. That model would focus on a much shorter time window. Uh, I think it was, they reduced it from something like a month to a week. Um, but, but of course it was necessary in this case. And then the, the horror story here, of course, is Microsoft Tay, where they, they put the model out, the chatbot model, the chatbot learned from people tweeting to it or, or chatting with it, and it picked up the worst of the internet. So, so that's kind of a, uh, a cautionary tale of this. So I, I, I just put two sentences here, measure, divergence, encourage, invariances. I, I really don't know what either of those sentences mean. Um, but I think it's something that is a challenge. And when I tried finding some libraries or literature, um, there, wasn't, there wasn't that much out there. Uh, and so, again, it's something where um, I'd be curious if folks have thoughts. and. I would also love to see more libraries pop up that help with this problem. One thing you can contrast this with is speed up time, iteration time. And by this, I mean, how long does it take to speed up a system? Um, and I should say that if you're at a company that makes more ad revenue than the GDP of, of certain countries, uh, or if you bought a lot of NVIDIA stock in 2015, uh, you can probably just ignore the, the content of the slide. I would too. 
Uh, but generally, from what I've seen, speed of time, iteration time is pretty fast. Um, so in, in contrast to the previous model iteration, model update iteration time. Um, so, so why is this? Especially for research to production, you know, researchers, they, they don't have, they don't, they're not worried about the latency, right? They're worried about the performance on a certain benchmark. And so they'll go well past the point of diminishing returns oftentimes. So maybe the model's way bigger than it really needs to be, or maybe they're even using an ensemble of eight models. So right off the bat, you probably have five different ways in which you can reduce the size or the amount of compute needed for something by a factor of two. Um, so right off the bat, you probably have, can get like a 30x speed up without too much effort. And the other aspect is that this is well-defined, right? And I think this is actually the most important point. You have your system and you want to make it go faster. Um, well, oftentimes you can just take your favorite profiler, go through, um, figure out what you need to focus on and to be honest, generally I'll see that the, the hard parts, uh, which are, are perhaps the convolutional kernels, the matrix multiply kernels, um, are, are done, right? Uh, and, and I'm certainly not saying that making matrix multiply kernels is, uh, is easy. I, I've tried it and wow, was I confused. Um, but, but beyond that, other stuff that you're working on on top of it, I think it's, it's possible to profile and, and get good speed ups. Um, and yeah, if, if all else fails, you know, what you do is just deploy your solar system on AWS with uh, GPU instances, watch your cache go bye-bye, and you'll figure out some way to speed things up. Um, one example I think is interesting, which ties together the first couple of sections, is in text-to-speech uh, in a paper called WaveNet. So this was 2016. Um, so the context is, at the time, most deployed, uh, oh sorry, I should say that this example, that there's so many other examples, you can find this in neural machine translation, you can find examples in, in object detection, I'm sure, uh, but this is just one example that I thought was interesting for TTS. Um, so at the time, the dominant approach for deployed TTS systems was this so-called unit selection method. So you would have some text, say, PGE will file schedules on April 20th, and this should be text analysis, you go through this text analysis step. Um, you perform some analysis of the prosody and, and other attributes. And then what would happen is um, short little snippets, units would be selected, and then they would be put together post-processed in order to generate the final waveform. This was how TTS systems worked. Uh, so if you think back to the first section on these, these complex pipelines, um, this is certainly one of them. And then in 2016, summer 2016, there was this WaveNet paper that, where they still uh, have the first steps here. So they still would run some of this step, but instead of doing unit selection, what they did was they would condition on that information and then they would try and generate the waveform directly. Meaning if you have a 16 kilohertz waveform, you would generate 16,000 samples per second. Um, which seems kind of crazy, but it got it to work. Um, it achieved a mean opinion score that was much higher than other deployed systems. I think people are saying it probably advanced the field by five years. Um, and so this is, of course, just an example of how these end-to-end -end deep learning systems can, can help. Uh, but one criticism of the work when it came out was that it was really slow. So if you look at this, as you go along, you have to condition on more and more previous contexts in order to generate the next sample. And so it gets slower as you're generating these later samples. Um, I don't know the exact number, but I think it was at least 50x slower than real time. And so people were critical of this. Um, I, I think I was also like, eh. But looking back, you know, it, it may be slow, but if you think about the discussion of iteration time, it's still much faster than the amount of time they, they need to take to train the models. And you know what? I'm sure they, they thought that they could speed it up if they needed to. And sure enough, I think a year and a half later, it was deployed and a thousand X faster than the system that they described in this paper. 
Okay, so third topic, opaque models. Um, I have the, this comparison of, that tries to give a sense of the trade-offs with some of these deep learning models, which is really kind of what I mean when saying opaque models. So what we want is something that's interpretable, that's controllable, um, that's like a science, right? Maybe it'd be really nice if you could write a compact set of, of laws that describe how these systems behave. Unfortunately, that's not the case, but what we have is something that's really powerful and expressive. Um, but if you saw the NIPS talk a few years ago, but it can be described more like alchemy, right? Um, and so there's this cute little analogy here of knobs on a radio versus a kite, um, where maybe you can kind of guide it, but a lot of it is just up to the mercy of the winds. Um, so, so that's fine and all. I think this describes some of the characteristics of previous ML methods and deep neural nets, uh, but I don't really think it gives you a visceral sense of what we mean when we say these uh, opaque models. And so I have an incantation here to indoctrinate folks who perhaps don't really, don't completely buy in to the cult of opaque models. Um, here it is. We improve 3% on existing state of the art by training a bi-directional LSTM and stacking it on top of another bi-directional LSTM. <laughs> um, I know we had the example, Alice enjoyed her time in Wonderland, where I was saying that it's quite unlikely for certain sentences to occur, even at six tokens. Uh, but you know, there was some NLP researcher who basically said this verbatim in 2015 or 2016. I probably said this verbatim in 2015 and 2016. Uh, and on the one hand, it's pretty amazing that you, you have this level of abstraction in the sentence. But on the other hand, there's really, does anybody really know what's going on here um, when you say something like this? Uh, so I think that's, that's kind of gives you a more visceral sense of what we mean by these opaque or black box models. Um, yeah, and if you're really hardcore, you know, you can get the equations uh, tattooed as well. Uh, so one other view is, I, I saw this tweet recently from Kareem Carr, who I think is a statistician. Uh, he posted this video and captioned it, how statistics people feel watching people in machine learning solve problems. Uh, so let me play that really quick. <laughs> uh, and, and when I saw this video, uh, I started cracking up because uh, <laughs> it's so true. Like sometimes the methods we use for certain tasks can really feel like overkill. Um, one fun exercise actually, as you watch this video is, you can try and associate cliffs with certain architectures, right? Like uh, uh, Perceptron, the net, Siamese net. Um, anyways, yeah, so, so what, what was the point I was trying to make here? Right, what's the goal though? If, if your world is just popping balloons and the entire reward function is how you can pop balloons in really exquisite ways. I, I think it's hard to argue against what this guy is doing. Um, but I think as an onlooker and taking a step back a little bit, um, it seems pretty dangerous. And so uh, I think beyond just, you know, this, this being overkill for certain tasks, I think it's also an apt analogy because sometimes it's, you should be a little bit cautious before deploying these models. So one case uh, that illustrates that is with what I think of as hard constraints and to, um, to demonstrate this, I think it's useful to think about a couple of extremes. One is click-through rate. So say you're trying to improve the click-through of news articles or product listings. Um, and then the other is vehicle detection, presumably for autonomous vehicles. Uh, those two require very different approaches, right? So um, obviously for click-through rates, if somebody doesn't click a particular article, it's, it's okay. Uh, whereas on the other hand, if a vehicle isn't consistently detected, um, that, that can have fatal consequences. With, these multi-arm bandit problems, there's an entire notion of exploration versus exploitation, right? Whereas for uh, vehicle detection, hopefully you're only doing that in simulation. Um, so 
I, I also include this link to a pretty useful introduction to different types of evaluation metrics. And I think it's important, um, really important for research to production because say you have a trade-off curve, right? And you're optimizing to hit the corner of the trade-off curve. Uh, so say precision recall, and you really need really high precision and really high recall. Um, depending on how close you are to that corner, that makes a lot of decisions for you on things that you can and can't do, you know, given, say, the amount of data that you have. Um, so, yeah, and this goes beyond training and validation. Right? So one thing that I think it could also be discussed more is safeguards. Um, so say you've built a really nice text generation system and you want to deploy it. Uh, and sometimes the system will generate profanity because the training data had profanity. Um, so you want a profanity filter. Okay. I, I looked for a profanity filter a couple years back and let's just say there's no hugging face for profanity filtering. Maybe there is now, at the time there certainly wasn't. Um, and I don't think you want to build this amazing text generation system and then build a really crummy, you know, thrown together profanity filter at the end. Um, another thing which I think is useful to do in these cases is a different sort of validation set. Not necessarily adversarial data um, where you have some attack vector, but let's say data that users may input in, in a perfectly normal interaction with your system, uh, but that ends up causing really pathological behavior. I think that is actually really interesting and, and it can be sometimes really hard to figure out as well. Um, and of course, monitoring on updates. But really, I think just a slide, uh, what I'm trying to get across is there's a depth and rigor tour that, it, that there exists for training models, validating models that really doesn't exist, I think, when you're trying to um, deploy these models and put them out into the wild, if you will. With bias and fairness as well, uh, I saw this tweet recently from Hannah Wallach that describes something similar. So one of her students, Su Lin, surveyed 146 papers looking at bias in NLP systems. Um, and they had a few conclusion and recommendations among those that people in the papers tend to just focus on NLP literature. They don't really go outside of the literature um, to say literature talking about social hierarchies. They'll describe some metric regarding bias uh, and then just say that it's good to lower that metric without really thinking about the downstream effects. And I, I think the third point they made was just seeing more research, going from research to application. Um, and so here, there's a certain amount of looking at the downstream effects and applying rigor to, to the process uh, that I think there needs to be more of. Uh, but assuming you know you build a system and you think that the constraints in the constraints that you have make sense, um, you set up safeguards and you think about the downstream effects and you still want to deploy it, uh, there there can still be funny little behavior. So this is a an old result from a while ago of Google neural, Google's neural machine translation system where a user typed egu 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 over and over. And because the system has never seen this type of input before, it would just generate this crazy, hallucinate this crazy gibberish. Um, and there was this article from Douglas Hofstadter, the author of Godel Asher Bach, where he, he described these systems. And he used just the perfect word to describe this behavior, um, which is that it wobbles. Uh, so the user inputs egu, 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 the model goes wobble, 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 and you end up with this type of behavior. So, I think Google's neural machine translation team published a post recently talking about how they improve things across the board, including with these hallucinations, uh, but still something to look out for. Um, you know, I don't know what you feel when you read a paper that describes an amazing result. That, that's almost like an existence proof. You, didn't, you weren't quite sure if it was even possible before. Um, or the sensation you get when you deploy a system or see a deep learning system deployed and, and you can tell it's one uh, just by the strange ways in which it misbehaves. Um, but to me, it feels like I'm watching something like this. 
it's it's really such a thrill. Um, and I think that if you think about how to iterate quickly, um, think about the trade-offs of these really opaque models, uh, and also factor in the ways in which different factors of the problem can compound in strange ways. Um, you'll, if you haven't, you'll, you'll deploy one of these systems or, or deploy more of these systems, and there's a good chance that it'll work better than anything else that anyone's ever deployed. Um, that's it. Thanks. Nice. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, let's do questions. I see some popping up already. Oh my God, Hans got a three-parter. Uh, let's dive in. So the first question is, what data annotation tool do you prefer for annotating text uh, data for say um, NER or multi-rank uh, classification? Yeah. Uh... It's a good question. Data is obviously really critical. Um, so I have to admit, with us, due to budgetary constraints, we, we would love to be able to annotate data, but generally we will try and figure out data augmentation schemes uh, based off of the existing data that we already have. I know there's great annotation systems out there. I'm sure you know there's figure eight with Lucas, of course. Uh, but, and I think, uh, oh gosh, what was it, Prodigy? There was, there was some system, other system out there, um, but I'm, I'm not really not familiar with them. Yeah. You mentioned data augmentation. Uh, what kinds of data augmentation methodologies are you using? Sure, yeah, so for text in particular, as I mentioned, the naive methods can sometimes really mangle the text or change the meaning. So. Uh, I think the most obvious thing people try is you will drop certain words um, or you will swap them or insert additional words. It could be at the character level as well. Uh, and, and the crazy thing is this has actually worked well for all these different pre-training methods. I didn't see that coming. Uh, but for us, what we found actually worked was actually this method called back translation, where you take your existing parallel corpus. So say you have a corpus from English to French, and then you will take additional monolingual French data, a train a reverse system, and use your system to actually translate it back to English. And then you have additional half synthesized parallel data. So back translation uh, is really useful. Yeah. Nice. Uh, awesome. The second question from Han is, what do you recommend as a metric or algorithm to monitor input data, uh, to ma uh, monitor input data drift? for uh, NLP? Yeah, um, input data drifts. So yeah, I have the slide on monitoring. Uh, we have certain quality metrics at the end where we look at how often users will accept suggestions that we make. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't have any great method to share for measuring the input drift. I, I know that there's, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is something like just looking at comparing the bag of words, bag of unigrams and bigrams. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't have cool. a great suggestion Bye. there. Nice. And then uh, Han's third question is, uh, what's a good alternate uh, way to speed up text generation uh, in addition to feeding AWS a lot of money or uh, reduce beam search sampling size? Yeah, uh, so, so those are both good ways. Uh, reducing beam search, you can, if people haven't tried, you can run with very low beam search and usually get very good results. Um, other ways, distillation is one method. Quantization, if you can, that, that, may, that may prevent you from using your favorite framework. Uh, and then just also making sure that you're using the best libraries. Uh, if you're running on CPU, things like, it's called SIMD or AVX. Um, if you're running on GPU, there's all those CUDA libraries as well. Cool. Uh, Charles, did you have a question? Because there's some on YouTube as well. Yeah. Um, one thing, I'm just going to drop this in the chat. Uh, just for natural language processing, data augmentation, there was a nice presentation at one of our 
previous salons by Jack Morris uh, on uh, their text attack uh, library. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like the things you were describing, word substitution based off of like uh, word vector similarity and um, like, and synonym uh, like thesauruses. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's nowhere near as good as the perturbations and translations that we can apply to images and audio. Uh, but it is a step in that direction, and it's a nice uh, it's a nice package. I took 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 a look at it after uh, their talk, and it was uh, very good. So might be worth uh, checking out. Um, but I wanted to pull in actually one of the questions from YouTube. Uh, so, uh, do you do any work with um, audio natural language processing, or is it primarily text? Ah. Uh. Um, so by audio natural language processing, do they mean going from speech to text or, or processing the audio in another way? Uh, yeah, I mean, their question is about vernaculars and accents. Um, oh, gotcha. So, uh, so my presumption is that it, that this, you know, you need an audio in order to have, uh, an accent, right? So I'm right. just, so do you work with natural language processing that uses all, like recordings of natural language to do some downstream NLP tasks? Right, uh, so we do not, um, but I know Auni Hanun, uh, A-W-N-I-H-A-N-N-U-N, wrote a post maybe a year or two ago about some of the phenomena with speech and accents. Um, he had this great post about remaining challenges in speech recognition, now that we have these speech systems trained on a ton of data. Mm -hmm. so, so that might be helpful, um, but yeah, we don't work with that type of data. Cool. Yeah, thanks. I thought found that question particularly interesting because I was reading some papers earlier this week about how court transcription done by humans, actually just the quality of the transcriptions when applied to African-American vernacular English is substantially worse than to prestige dialects of English. Uh, and right. this is the kind of thing we'd like to be able to maybe use machine learning to like automate OA biases, but contemporary methods can suffer from the same uh, biases that uh, humans do. Yeah, uh, de definitely. Um, and I think that is something where perhaps we, we don't have the right data right now, but it is um, a nice part of the, about the ML system as well is that if we can get that, it can adapt uh, to it. Uh, Salim asks, would you tell us more about sapling and also your transition from uh, being a PhD student to the industry? Yeah, sure. So sapling, um, sapling.ai, you can check out the website. We have this animated screenshot that, that shows a few of the different features from autocomplete to uh, correcting the text to suggesting replies in chat. Uh, but regarding going from PhD to this, uh, actually started working on some aspects of this uh, while before I had finished. Um, and there, there's advantages to that, but I, I personally would not recommend it because it can also cause some misalignments. So if you are thinking of doing a PhD, but you're interested in a startup as well, uh, I, would, I would talk to some people who have done that. And I imagine the suggestion you all get is finish your PhD, take a break, and then uh, get back to startup stuff if you're interested in it. So You were doing both at the same time? That's nuts. Uh, I tr if you can call it that, yeah. Interesting. So. Which one suffered? I'm curious. The startup or the PhD? Oh, I'm sure both suffered yeah, early on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so someone on YouTube uh, asks, uh, this is a slightly longer question, uh, so they're a linguistic uh, major uh, than undergrad and they're in their senior year and they've been doing phonology research which has given them insight into formal language theory and applications to natural language and they were wondering if they went to grad school to study uh, just linguistics, uh, would they be hireable for NLP jobs? Um, if so, if, what should they leverage in their current uh, program uh, to be competitive for NLP jobs? Yeah, so one of my uh, advisors was Dan, Dan Drasky. Um, I think he's 
he's in the CS and linguistics department. I'm guessing his heart is really in, more on the linguistics side of things. I'm not sure. Uh, but I think linguistics right now, there's, there's so much going on in computational linguistics. And um, I wish I had learned more during grad school, actually. Uh, but I feel now more than ever, there's, there's lots of overlap there. Um, and I think you can do really cool stuff as well that that isn't just a, a function of amount of data and, and model size. Uh, so this may also be a good time. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting. And if you do cool work, I don't see why it would bottleneck you. Thanks. They also asked, are you looking for an intern? <laughs> oh, sapling. Uh, we currently are not. Uh, we wish we were in a position where we were, but currently no, sadly. Um. So as somebody who also went from, uh, very recently, from academia to industry, I found the point that you made about uh, how a lot of academic work is obsessed with things that bring very diminishing returns. So this sort of like soda fetish that people have, um, uh, which is also reflected in Kaggle, where there's these like giant ensemble models that get just like a tiny fraction of additional performance on some test set. So I'm wondering, what kind, like you're out of academia now, but do you have any thoughts about what kind of culture shift might be necessary? What changes and in incentives uh, could make it so that people do research that would be more helpful for people working in applications um, in industry? Yeah, it's it's a really good question, and um, yeah. I, I haven't, I don't think I have that great a feel for, for what's best to do here, but I do think that there have been some interesting initiatives here, like for example, uh, folks trying to push for how well you can perform um, on a certain budget. I think that the, the interest in leaderboards and the amount of compute as well has been largely driven by uh, industry with lots of budget who, who are trying to compete on these for to build the, perhaps build the brand of a particular lab. Um, but yeah, like I, I think like you said, folks are realizing that there needs to be broader range of work. Um, and if you're in academia, it may make sense to focus on um, perhaps more fundamental aspects of of machine learning, of deep learning, as opposed to competing with lead on leaderboards. But uh, I'm sure I'll continue, and I really don't have a great suggestion. Yeah, that's fair. It's a, a tough, tough question, definitely. Um, and yeah, maybe the the scale of the problem is exemplified, actually, by the point you made about, uh, you know, Yashua Benji was saying that if only they'd been training for months in the 90s, they would have advanced like five or 10 years faster. Uh, mm -hmm. Like the people working on neural networks in the 90s were getting the pants beat off of them by, you know, SDMs, Gaussian process models, like, you know, sophisticated approaches to linear and logistic regression. Um, but it was only this sort of like fundamental, you know, this fundamental shift that was able to get us to where we are today. It's really hard to figure out how to incentivize that. Yeah. Do, do you have some additional thoughts there about how to incentivize that behavior? Uh, you thought about it? <laughs> I, I got a I got a lot of thoughts, not all of them, <laughs> you know, uh, suitable for recording. But I would say number one is increasing resources to academia to allow people to like get out of the like short feedback loop of having to publish in order to get grants in order to publish. Um, if people were uh, less squeezed, they could think a little bit longer term. But yeah. All right. Thank you, Zhang. Uh, that was really good.